Oops. Um. Oh, a recording. We got it. <laughs> Hi, I'm I'm board member Pete Souza. I've been in the organization for approximately 22 years now. Uh, tonight, I have the pleasure and honor to introduce a dear friend and a remarkably talented Captain Jim Sharp, former owner of Schooner Adventure and now chair and founder of the Sail, Power, and Steam Museum located in Rockland, Maine. Hey, that's, that's me. The, the, the world famous Sail, Power, and Steam Museum, as Jim calls it. And there you go. Co-founder with his wife, Meg. Uh, they've done incredible things up there. If you haven't been there, you need to go. In 1988, Captain Sharp donated the Schooner Adventure to the stewards of Gloucester with the assistance of Joe Garland. Adventure came home. Gloucester needed a schooner, an original. And for almost 34 years now, Gloucester has been her home. We are thankful for this gift of adventure, and she has been maintained in exceptional condition, sailing, educating, and providing historic evidence of her lengthy career as a Gloucester fishing schooner. Tonight, Captain Sharp will give us a bit of history of her main windjammer days, and I call it Adventures Adventures, and share some <laughs> news of his museum's happenings, which have been incredible over the past year with the sailing programs that he's got going on with kids. So without delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Captain Jim Sharp and Meg Sharp. Hey. hey, that's us. That's okay, us. Hun. Now, how do we get there? All right. Sit down and just wait for a great story. <laughs> See if we can get this up here. From the beginning. Okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> Am I on there? Am I on there? Yes, you are. I think you are, Jim. Looks good Let's to me. Jim. Okay. Uh, can you see our logo here? The, Ten four on the logo. Yeah, it looks good, Jim. That, okay. Two people waiting in the so. Well, welcome all you Zoomers. We're so glad to be here. And uh, <laughs> now we got a clear screen. Okay, good. Here we go, YG. Uh, my wife and I, we started at this museum, this crazy museum, 12 years ago, about a dozen years ago. We are so full now, full of memorabilia. We're so excited about doing this. We're not talking about that tonight. We're going to do this little program, open the screen to do this little program on. <laughs> now what happened? There. Uh, we, we'll get this straightened out. You just wait and see. The old adventure. This uh, adventure flag here is a representation of a reproduction of the adventure flag that Leo Hines had that they would use when they wanted to call the Dories back. And we made a copy of it. It's a beautiful, great big flag. We'd use it for special occasion, things like that. Leo used it to call the dories back when, oh, there was a threat of weather or there was some other reason why these dories that are spread all over the Grand Banks, uh, why whatever reason that occurred, they would call them back to the ship, to the mother ship. And we made this for our, our purposes, incredible purposes. On the old schooner adventure, well, now here, you know, the old schooner adventure, what a piece of gear she is. What an incredible sailing vessel. Look at her going across the, across the bay there doing a 14 knot, going like mad. She came from the same gene pool, the wonderful gene pool that uh, was created by the Gertrude Tebow, the Puritan, the Columbia, all of those great incredible schooners that graced against the uh, Blue Nose. Now, of all the vessels of the old days, Donald McKay's clipper ships, uh, the, the great down easters that they made in Maine and uh, America's Cup, but all of these vessels, you can count them all up, but none of them hold a candle to the Gloucester fishing schooner. The Gloucester schooners are just the most incredible, in my mind, most incredible vessels going there. Swift, they're beautiful, and they're able. 
and uh, they just can't touch them with anything else. They are the quintessence. The adventurer and I were, were partners for 24 years. 24 years I sailed that vessel. 24 years I learned her habits. I learned her quirks. I learned her likes and dislikes. What do you mean likes and dislikes? It's an inanimate, inanimate object. No, it isn't. The, the, the adventure is something, something else that. Adventure has her own spirit. Adventure has her own, her own soul. And uh, the, the impact of that very soul I felt, and I stood back and I watched her magic for 24 years. It was really an incredible vessel. These vessels, these thoroughbred, these vessels, if you've never sailed on the Gloucester fishing schooner, you better put it on your bucket list. Look at that great bow, how that thing would part the water and how it would beat to windward and just go incredibly well. Well, my wife and I, we had such a great time with that vessel. <clears throat> and. Uh, after 24 years, we decided when we get ready to go over to the bar, we're gonna do something for the rest of the community and uh, decided at that time, well, we're gonna to have to have a museum. So we rolled the curtain back and we, we created this little museum. I'm not gonna dwell on this for very long. I'm gonna surprise you later on and give you the commercial. But I just wanted to show you very quickly up in the middle there, the middle top, that's the old museum. That's the museum building filled with memorabilia now, filled so solidly with memorabilia, we're overflowing, we're chocker block. So we had to build a new building. So over on the left, you see the new building that we had just put together. This was this, the, the picture was taken this past fall. There's the last fall flower on the rose bush down below and uh, the flag supply in. The building is completed. In the spring, we'll be filling it full of artifacts, antique boats, we have 20 antique boats we'll be putting in there and filling it up. There's so many different uh, legs on the octopus of this museum. We do lobster bakes in the summertime. We do uh, music all winter long and summer as well. We do all these things. We have the captain's quarters where we have interviewed the captains of all of the main Windjammer fleet, 15 of them, and they're all on our website. You can go and learn their history and all about it. And as Peter mentioned, that one of the greatest things that we've done, we created our SCIF program. Join the SCIF program, sell these kids. We take these kids from six to 14 years old. We put them through one solid week of free sale training. We get them out there, they forget about their telephones, forget about uh, everything and the internet and all that stuff. And it is, just makes me warm and fuzzy all over. It's a great thing. But now we don't want to dwell on that. We've got to part the, part the curtain again and look at that magnificent vessel doing probably 12 knot you can see the little bow wave she has eight to ten knot and she doesn't make any bow wave she just makes a little gurgle up around the bow so fine is that bow and so shapely is that vessel when she gets up to 12 13 knots she starts to raise a bow wave and a quarter wake that comes back in on the quarter well there she is on the beam reach what is more delightful in this world than a beam reach Let's go back, way back, way back, 1954. This uh, consortium of men, uh, Donny, Don Hurd, uh, Herbie Beiser, and Captain Dayton Newton, they got together and they had a vessel called the Maggie. And the Maggie was an old coaster, an old centerboard coaster, about 80 feet long. And she was so tired, she was a real slid. She was all hogged down and rotting away from underneath them. And they said, my God, we've got to get a better vessel. Well, the adventure finished fishing in 1953, not because she was worn out, but because her men were all over 70 years of age. They couldn't go dory trolling anymore. So the adventure was put up in, in the creek, uh, Chelsea Creek and put up for sale. And she lay there for, nobody wanted that old vessel because she was a dory trawler. They were all going into big power vessels at that time. So these guys were able to come along and buy that vessel. I think they paid $9,000 for it. Then they sold the engine out of her, the old Cooper Bessemer that was in her, for $6,000. So they didn't really have much of an investment in the vessel. They took her to Maine, towed her to Maine. They put her in Maine. They put her, put her in the windjammer business. They took the sails off the Maggie, a 70, 80-foot vessel, and they put them right on the adventure. Look at the poor old thing. The masts were cut down when she finished her fishing career. 
and they took the sails off the Maggie and put them on the adventure. The main boom doesn't even come out beyond the rail on the stern. Uh, about 2,800 square feet of sail they put on the adventure and expected her to sail. The poor old thing, they didn't treat her very well. They called her the garbage cow of Islesbury because they used to try to go in there and anchor and then throw their garbage overboard. And here she is, you can see the gurry running down, running down her topsides there. They don't even clean her topsides up. Her anchor hanging from the bow and the ladder hanging over the stern for the yaw boat operator. And a whole bunch of baggy wrinkle going up on the top of this file. Oh, poor, poor, poor old nuts. And they kept her in Booth Bay Harbor in the wintertime. Of course, they didn't have her fests uh, to the dock very well. And uh, they had a fish boat behind them and a gale of wind that banged into them a couple of times, broke their fasts, and she went up in the cove uh, in the head of Booth Bay. A couple of days later, they were able to get her back out of the mud and put her back where she belonged. 1953, she was aground again in Rockland Harbor. The old anchor still hanging from the bow and the gurry running down the sides where you can see there. Painted masts and oh my God, what a, a dismal kind of thing. 10 years they ran that vessel. This is what she looked like when they were running her those 10 years. Poor Gloucester fishing schooner, a, a breed, a thoroughbred breed. And she's looking like some kind of old garbage scow. In 1957 was my first introduction to the adventure. I came up with a bunch of my high school buddies. We graduated in 1951. There were a bunch of us still single. And I said, we were sailors. I said, let's go up to Maine. Let's go to Maine and go on one of these big wind jammers. We were looking for girls. So we picked out the biggest one up there we could find. That was the adventure. We thought we'd meet girls there. So we went up and we went into the cabin, uh, the cabin down by the mainmast there. They called it the Black Hole of Calcutta. The four of us went in there and we we drank beer and chased girls all around the adventure. I was fascinated by Regan and all that, everything that she had. But oh my God, she didn't do much sailing. But Captain Dayton Newton, he was a, a real salty guy. He sang sea shanties and played the guitar and yo ho ho on a bottle of rum and all that kind of stuff. Everybody was fascinated by it. But look at that little rag, that little pocket handkerchief they had for a jib up there. That didn't do anything for that poor old vessel. Look at the crazy rig they had on. Look at the top and lifts there cutting into the belly of the mainsail. They don't even slack their top and lifts off when they go sailing. No, the captain of that vessel was scared of it. He was afraid of it. And uh, my God, uh, it, it gave, gave me a whole new education on this. Again, 1964, poor old Newt. Going into Islesbury, got, a, got her aground right at high water. In fog, he didn't know where he was exactly. She said, it's just a stone throw from the ferry terminal. And he put her on a ledge there, and the tide went out, and she lay on her bilge, lay over on her side. They took all the passengers off, put them on the ferry boat, and sent them back to the mainland. You can see they have, in, uh, they have a hose going down into the bilges to keep her pumped out uh, with a little engine in there and a big pump. Uh, not very well cared for it. They had a Calvin on the main house there, but the Calvin that would be carried overboard every time that they jived or tacked the, the, well, poor old vessel. Anyway, this gave me an opportunity because Captain Newt said, I'm all done with the adventure. I'm never gonna sail her again. It was the last end of the season. They towed her back to Rockland for the winter. And I called up uh, after talking with Bob Douglas, we talked it all over made up a schematic of what she might make and so on. I called up Don Hurd and I said, Don Hurd, is the adventure for sale? He said, you bet it is. So anyway, we made a deal. I got, I was able to buy that vessel. My first trip then was 1965. I got a whole gang of kids from the uh, uh, main, uh, oh, uh, I forget the main, uh, forget the name of it. But anyway, it was all kids that were, uh, reform school kids, kids that were in trouble with the police, kids that had been in and out of jail, 35 kids that have really need some kind of direction. And we took them out for two weeks. That was my first trip on the adventure. And my God, the adventure was in terrible condition. We had them sanding, painting, uh, scraping paint, cleaning the bilges, cleaning the vessel up, and it needed an awful lot of cleaning up in those early days. But for two weeks, we shouted and screamed at those kids and made it perform. They were all inhibited, inhibited. They came aboard and they were hardly talking to each other. By the end of two weeks, they were gathering their friends' addresses and telephone numbers and they came around the bend. 
It was really a very satisfying thing, but an awful lot of work. But I looked at that vessel and I said, we've got to do something about that vessel. I dreamed that winter of changing her over. Well, here's the dream. I wanted to make a real Gloucester fishing schooner, give her the what she needed to be the thoroughbred she was. I needed to put masts in her and I needed to get her going. From that picture up in the upper right hand corner, I wanted to make her look like the, the lower left over there. So the only thing to do was to roll my sleeves up and go to work. I called up Pigeon Hollow Spark Company. I said, I need a mainmast, 96 feet long, 96 feet long, 20 inch diameter. Put it through your lathe down there, get it from Oregon that came from uh, the West Coast, came around through the canal on a ship. They dropped it off in Boston. They put it through their lathe. And here it is. You can see the, the bands in that lower left hand there where, where we made uh, shoulders for the bands to fit on. I didn't want to put bolts through the masthead because that's a great place for water to get in and rot the masthead. So I put bands around and clamped them on there. And you can see in that little lower picture that we hung the peak blocks on her. My gang up on the rip mast there getting the rigging put together when they finally got that mast in. But that wasn't the whole of, pic of the picture. Here we are taking the masts out. I'd taken the schooner from Camden. Uh, I took the, no, the, the, yes, I took the schooner from Camden down to Rockland, put it at the shipyard down there. They had an old steam crane. They picked the masts out. I put the main the mainmast down on the uh, in the dooryard there at the shipyard, and uh, we picked the foremast out and laid it in the water. I had my yaw boat there. I pushed the yaw boat, uh, pushed the schooner back to Camden, tied her up there, came back down with the yaw boat. I lashed her under that foremast and I towed it back up to Camden. We put it on the old launching ways down in the lower left there, the old launching ways at the shipyard, and we took a two man buck saw and. We cut it off to, uh, to uh, size. I'm playing musical spars. I took the old foremast out and we're cutting it off. We're gonna make a main boom out of it because the main boom's too short. I ordered a new set of sails. We gotta get a new main boom now. So I went to work, took that main, that old foremast at 18 inch diameter and the way you're making the spar is to square it up straight and true, put tapers on both ends for the boom, of course. You can see in the upper right there, the rot that was in that mast, that was mostly sapwood. We were able to move that uh, stick that we wanted around inside there, so we avoided all of that rot. Here I am turning on the lower right, turning it over, getting ready to eight-side it. Once you get it squared up straight and true, then you eight-side it, then 16-side it with planes and adzes, and then you 32-side it with draw shaves and planes, and then you 64-side it, and when they, they all say, after 64 side, any damn fool can turn it round. So we did, we turned it round. By God, we put it together and made a new main boom out of it. And here was the result. You can see my new main mist, my new main mist right in the center of her there. And uh, I took that foremast, uh, the old main mist out and we put it full size as the foremast was 77 feet long. Now the main mist 92 feet long and the, and the foremast 72 feet long worked out just right for the sail plan for the vessel, for the sail plan that she should have. Uh, new sails and so on. Here, of course, is the main boom that we were making all that time. It's now 60 feet, almost 60 feet long, sticking out over the stern. I took the old main boom and I made a main gaff out of it, 42 feet long on the main gaff. I took the old main gaff that they used and I made a topmast out of that, 40 feet long for the topmast. Then, of course, we could fly a topsail and give her the sail that she needed. That mainsail was 3,150 square feet. In the mainsail alone, that's uh, more than she had the whole sail plan off of the old Maggie. So now we had uh, an addition to this one, the main top of staysail that we put on so that she carried 6,000 square feet. And look at that hull, that beautiful long hull. She was now in the position to drive that hull and make it really go. So exciting. Bud Hawkins and the Mary Day, one of my good friends, the Mary Day was a new schooner. They had just built her in 1962. She was a hundred ton. She was light on her feet and he was a marvelous sailor, a wonderful man. And she could dodge those ledges and go around those islands 
uh, with a 100-ton vessel just as quick as could be. After we got rigged up on the adventure, there was that great main boom over my head, almost 60 feet long. We just challenged him to a race. And uh, I would win when wind came up hard. We had a long fetch, but the Merry Day would win every time we had short tacks and uh, round islands and things like that. So we neither one of us won all the time, and some of us always won, won enough so that it didn't discourage us. So we decided we would have a competition, friendly competition. And passengers loved it. They would heckle the other boats, and we would sail all around Penobscot Bay on Friday afternoon, set out a course, and uh, there's a good breeze of wind. Uh, what great fun that was. That's what we used to do back in those days. Uh, that great vessel going on the country mile, 122 feet long now. My God, what a wonderful piece of gear she was. And what an incredible, incredible sailing boat. For a sailor, she's the best. She's absolutely the quintessence of any vessel you can think of. Here we are going off to the western and a half a gale of wind. Uh, ground swell coming in there. Of course, she picked her stem up, water running everywhere. You can see all the gang, all the passengers are way back aft because the next wave we went into looked like that. Blowing smoke, blowing uh, spray all over the foredeck. They didn't want to get themselves wet. <clears throat> but that old bow would smoke, smack down into the wave coming up there and just parted like nothing at all. We were making 12, 12 14 knots. Off to the western, we sailed from Camden to Portland in seven hours, 75 miles in seven hours. And uh, what a ride it was. This is a, from the deck view. That's the Angelique over there. And that Mike Anderson took those pictures of us sailing down by. Now this was a different one. This was off Camden. The old vessel foaming along there. We had a good breeze of wind on a Friday, and Sam Manning was out in his dory. He had a fishing dory, and took a Neil Parent out with him. Neil Parent was a photographer, a great photographer, and they were coming, coming along with their dory, and we came along. And of course, when we got in front of them, they were they were hiked out on the rail trying to keep that dory upright in the breeze of wind. And when we got in front of them, we stole all the wind away from them. They darn near turned over to windward. They had to jump the other side of the dory in order to keep it upright. Neil was able to snatched this picture when we went by and of course after we went by then the wind spilled off of my mainsail and practically turned them over to leeward. so they had to jump up and keep that old dory afloat and uh, it was pretty exciting for them but uh, great great picture of all the passengers all the gaga these great big sails and the uh, vessel doing 12 14 knot and sailing up the bay beautiful day this is much later on you can see the varnish on the, the skylight there and everything spit and polished. My crew, great crew I had those days. Wonderful, wonderful people keeping that vessel up. You can see the bend in the main boom there with the horsepower, that old mainsail, 3,150 square feet mainsail would develop. Everybody says, don't you, don't you worry about gales of wind? Don't you worry about the weather? Don't you worry about the uh, vessel leaning over and all? Oh, no, I don't. Uh, that vessel's able. What scared me was fog. Now that's something else again. The adventure 100 foot waterline, 230 ton vessel, lean and long, you can't stop her. Takes half a mile to turn that vessel around and you get in fog. We went 10 years by the seat of our pants. 10 years we sailed that boat. We had nothing but a lead line and a compass. And after 10 years, we finally got a fathometer and it wasn't too long after that that I finally got a low-powered radar, took all the anxiety out of it. But boy, you talk about anxiety before that. You're going along in, in that kind of fog and you know you've got a buoy up ahead and the buoy is uh, marking a ledge. <clears throat> and you know if you're on the wrong side of that ledge for one reason or another, you're reading the compass just as tight as you can. You corrected every morsel of that compass so you know you can steer a good course. Anyway. Yeah, the anxiety rises as you approach, as you're running your time out and you say to yourself, God, I got to get on the proper side of that buoy. So I'll give it another another point up to wind and go go on the good side of that buoy. And as you get even closer and more anxiety, you give it another point. Well, pretty soon you're passing that buoy too far away from it and you don't see it. Then you've lost your dead reckoning. Then what do you do? My God, 
that's what we had 45 people in my charge and that's what we had to wear deal with fog and fog will play tricks on you i've got a whole a whole parcel of tricks that fog has played on me i i should write a book oh as a matter of fact i think i have written a book i'll have to tell you about that sometime but fog was the was the big worry in those days We'd anchor, of course, <clears throat> we'd anchor with our big heavy anchors. We had one anchor that was 800 pounds, another one was 1,500 pounds, great heavy chain. And uh, we had a donkey engine, a 1902 Fairbanks, wonderful old donkey engine, six horsepower. That's Grant Gamble, a Gamble sailmaker. He's a sailmaker now. He was a young fellow in those days, just cutting his teeth on the old schooner adventure, trying to get her going. When she would run, of course, it was a make and break engine, bang, chee chee bang, bang, chee bang. And it would rumble, the whole vessel would shake back and forth. People would heave up early in the morning. Occasionally, we do this not too often. They'd come running up on deck. What on earth is happening? It sounded like thunder. But uh, uh, that was an able engine, and it ran and ran and ran down in the main cabin. Now, <laughs> this main cabin is beautiful. Of course, there's a rocking chair in the fireplace. And all of this fiddleback maple paneling, wonderful, wonderful paneling, all water soaked and, and full of ambiance. Uh, just the, the mystique of this main cabin was wonderful. Jeff Thomas, of course, you know, Jeff Thomas had this vessel built in 1926, and he died on deck in 1934, chipping ice off of the deck. Died on deck, but they were at sea in the dead of winter out on the Grand Banks. Well, his spirit, I think, is still aboard the vessel. I'm sure of it. I don't have to think. I'm sure of it. I know that bracken chair. I used to go ashore with uh, to lobster bakes, and I'd be the last one to leave the vessel, and I'd always tidy up and make sure the fires are out and the lights were off and so on. Ashore. And I'd see where that rocking chair was, and it would be right there. And when I would come back from the lobster bake, that rocking chair would be somewhere else. I'd be the first one aboard the vessel, and it would be moved. And I always laid it to Jeff Thomas. I know it was him because he would wake me up sometimes in the dead of night when the vessel was in peril. And I'd run up on deck to see what was wrong and guarantee there'd be something wrong. We'd have to get underway or re-anchor or something. Uh, something came up during the night. Well, I, I proved it later on. Mike McHenry was with this. Mike McHenry was my mate. He was a wonderful sailor. And he had recently gotten married and invited his, his uh, new wife to his bride to come aboard the vessel and go for a week with us. So in that bunk right behind the rocking chair, that's a big wide bunk. It was the widest bunk in the whole vessel. And he and his wife were in there sleeping in the middle of the night. Well, she woke up in the middle of the night and she heard this squeaking and she thought, what is that? And she opened the, opened the curtain and she peered out and she saw the rocking chair and it was rocking back and forth. But it wasn't rocking as if somebody had just bumped against it. It was rocking slowly and creaking as if there was weight in it. She was so scared, she turned back in, pulled the curtain shut, and went and hugged Mike for the rest of the night and didn't say a word about it. In the morning, of course, she woke up and told us all about it. And I said, oh, that was Jeff. Don't, you don't have to be worried. Jeff Thomas is a good man, and his spirit is still with us. Now here's the rocking chair in another position like I would find it when we'd come back from a lobster bait. That bunk over there in the center, that was Leo Hines bunk, back behind the guitar hanging there around the corner, that was my bunk back there. All of us had bunks close enough to the companionway so we could run out real fast. Of course, on all, all, the, all the paneling all around the main cabin, we had all this nautical part. Uh, octant there and parallel rules and so on and so forth, all part of the ambiance. Music, we would have music over and over again down in that main cabin. Hooting in the after, hooting in the after, hooting in. What a great place <clears throat> to have a musical event. And uh, everybody loved that main cabin, including me. There's one of the cabins that we had, cabins down there, <clears throat> down below. This is a four berth cabin. Upper and lower bunks, you can see they're beautifully uh, engraved bunk covers there. And we people come down, the ladies come down, they look in here, oh, where's the water? There isn't any water here. Oh, well, no, there's no water there. But we have a pan, we have a basin that you take up on deck and you can fill it from the barrel up on deck. That's where we had in the early days, we didn't have any water down below. So they would take their pan up on the deck and they would go to the beaker and they would 
ladle out a half a pan of cold water and go to the rail. And of course, they're all lined up there. They're all laughing about it, washing their face in cold water, making up skits about it, making up jokes about it, and so on. People are the darndest things. They, when they don't have any other alternative, they make up most creative things. And then, of course, they're brushing their teeth, and they're brushing their teeth, and they're spitting overboard. Well, pretty soon, you know, well, I can spit further than you. No, you can't. I can spit further than you. Pretty soon, there's a spitting contest. And they're doing all these crazy things like that. I get such a kick out of them, especially when they first come aboard. They first come aboard, and the ladies, the first thing they say is, where are the laboratories, Captain? I say, laboratories, man. We don't have laboratories. We have heads down below. You go down the companionway here and look over on the port end and you'll see the two heads right there. Two heads, they go over and they open the door and they look in there and, oh my God, it's the size of a telephone booth. I tell you, you know what a telephone booth is, don't you? And here, right in the center of the telephone booth is this great big commode taking up all the floor space with a big handle on the side of it because it's below the water level outside and you have to pump it in order to flush it. How are we going to last a whole week down here? Well, of course, the passengers come back year after year after year. The old passengers take the new ones by the hand and they tell them, don't worry, you're going to love it. It's going to be great. And then they have the girls go to their cabins and they have a stuff in, see how many girls they can get into one cabin. They have music and that's just great. Look at the beams overhead. You see the beam right there over the, the toilet room? You see how that beam is all pockmarked? This is the fish hole. This was the old fish hole of the adventure. And when they would fill the hold full of fish, forking them down below with these pitchforks, they would inadvertently, when the, when the, the fish hold got full, inadvertently they would hit the beam overhead and it was pitchmark, uh, uh, what do you call it? Pitchmark uh, pot marks all over it. Fish hold, you know you're in a real fishing vessel then. And there you have the, the little cottage small at the end of the hall. This was the only single berth cabin we had. You always use up every space you can for accommodation. There's no floor space in that bunk. You have to go in and just <clears throat> dress and undress, laying in the bunk. But it was very popular because it was a single cabin. And it's one of the cabins that sold out first. Had a little window right there. It's right by our piano. Had an awful lot of music on. This is right by the main cabin, of course. And we had that 66 key piano right there. People love playing that piano. And every, even if it's nothing but chopsticks, they would play that piano every week. Wonderful. There's the old main boom brought off, running before the wind. My God, a great long thing. You can see <clears throat> out at the end of it there, we baseball pitched that sail down so it was right close to the boom. And then all of the other foot ropes along the foot of the sail there, we eased off. That was because Bags Bondell had made that sail. He made a pocket in the leech of it, which destroyed its shape. That I, I couldn't stand that. So we had to reshape the sail by by tying it off to the main boom in a particular way, so we had proper proper uh, flow of air over that great long main sheet. Of course, now we're going up through the Egemagen Reach, up in the northern end of the bay there, the Egemagen Reach, where the Deer Isle Bridge goes across the Deer Isle from the mainland. And of course, the bridge is 95 feet from the water at mean high tide. That's the clearance. We had 82 and a half feet of clearance to the top of our mainmast. Then we had a topmast on top of that. Well, of course, we had to house the topmast when we were going through the bridge. And I was always very careful because if you had a southerly, the top of the tide would be higher because it would blow all the water up in there and it would give you less than 95 feet clearance. And uh, we never went through at a top of a tide. We always were safe. We always went through after the tide had fallen, maybe an hour or two. But sometimes it was pretty close. You can see on the right-hand side there, the, uh, the topmast now is housed. It's full down. It's uh, lashed in front of the mainmast there or lower down in front of the mainmast there. And uh, we're going onto the bridge. Well, the gang used to love to stand up on the top of that, that uh, sit on top of the mainmast there and watch the bridge clearing their heads by oh, a few feet, usually quite a few feet. But we had one guy, Andy Chase, I'll never forget him, wonderful person, good seaman, a wild man as a youngster. He eventually became one of the big wigs at the Maine Maritime Academy, followed the sea all the time. He stood on top of that mainmast 
with a, the truck of the topmost between his legs and he reached up and touched the bridge where we went under. Crazy man. That's my son coming down from the loft after putting the mast back up and getting rigged, rigged out again the way he ought to be. Back in those days, we didn't have any insurance problems and the Coast Guard kind of ignored us. So we rigged a Tarzan's way, one of the things that, well, you know, one of the crazy things you do when you're young and have foolish and you know, have lots of time. We put a line all the way to the masthead, 95 feet up there. And uh, when we heeled over on a good breeze, we would take that line and swing away from the vessel. And you'd go out there over 100 feet away from the vessel and watch the vessel sail past you. Wonderful entertainment on a good day. We were always racing another vessel. We, had, we were just coming up on another vessel and we happened to fall into his quarter wake and it burst on the side of the vessel and wetted everybody up aboard. There was a howls and howls of discomfort. This is my Sharps Point, uh, Sharps uh, Wharf in Camden. We built all these buildings, the uh, big building on the right there, we brought over from PG Willie. And that's where we had our shop and then eventually a restaurant over there. And all these buildings built there and the two vessels would lay there side by side, the Adventure and the Roseway. And of course, all painted up and beautiful. At this particular time, with the flags flying, three men came up on the dock and they said, uh, they weren't, they were obviously from somewhere away. They weren't main people. They had sunglasses on and jewelry and all kinds of crazy stuff. <clears throat> they, they said, uh, Captain, are uh, you the captain of that vessel? And I said, yes. They said, Captain, we're from Rosemont Productions in Hollywood. We want to do a, a, a another movie on Captain's Courageous. We want to redo the movie on Captain's Courageous. Oh, I said, yes, of course. This is a Gloucester fishing schooner, the adventure. And she's the same model as the Aretha Spinney. And the Aretha Spinney did the earlier version, the 1937 version of Captain's Courageous. Yes, we know that, sir. And uh, she's the only uh, Gloucester fishing schooner sailing nowadays. Yes, we know that, sir. That's why we wanted to talk to you. And I said, the Roseway, she's alongside, she's built the same way by the story out there in, in Essex and in the fashion of the Gloucester. Yes, we know that, Captain. We want to talk to you about making this movie. I said, boys, step into my office. So we did, and we made, a, uh, we made arrangements to do in 1977 a remake of Captain Courageous. Our captain was Carl Malden with his big red nose. Then we had Ricardo Montalban as a doryman, and we had Fred Gwynn and uh, Jeff Corey and all these actors, they came and they painted the vessel black and they aged and they antiqued it and put Gurry running down over the top sides, just like it used to look back in the days when uh, the former owners owned it in Islesboro. And uh, we had the uh, dories all over the deck and we went sailing out beyond, uh, beyond the islands, we had to be out where the Grand Banks were no water, no land around. And we were skipping along out there, the old adventure jumping from way to way when we were having so much fun sailing, racing with the roseway. They were all seasick. Every actor was seasick. Carl Malden's red nose was green. He, he, he couldn't act. None of the rest of them could act. There were four days we went out there and they couldn't do any acting. After four days, they finally got their sea legs and we made the movie. It was nowhere nearly as good as the 1937 version but it was a good money maker for a preseason charter. And it was very interesting doing the storm scene. Uh, this is Iron Bell. I've got to get going here. We've got such a long, uh, long program. I'm too loquacious, I guess. Iron Bound Island out uh, beyond Bar Harbor. What well, is prettier than the lee quarter of a sailing vessel where you can see the beautiful sails. Uh, Bob Douglas came up on the Shenandoah one time. Got to tell you quickly about that. He came up uh, on a visit to sail with the main wind jammer. So Red Hawkins on the merry day and myself, we were all in touch with the radios. We went out and met him out off of Matinicus out there. Had a nice southwest breeze of wind, <clears throat> and wind making up all the time, getting stronger and stronger as we sailed in. I sailed away out beyond him, came, turned around and came back under, under his stern. Merry day tacked right alongside him and uh, they were both ahead of us. Well, as we came up the bay, the wind increasing, the adventures took charge and passed all the, both of them. We were coming up there in fine style, came up uh, by uh, Owl's Head Lighthead, Lighthouse, and they said, well, we're gonna, we'll go to Islesboro and anchor for the night. I said, that'd be great. And uh, we had our sails out, so on. 
running along beautifully. And then they get up off of Rockland there and they said, well, let's let's go over to Pulpit Harbor. I said, Pulpit Harbor? I don't want to go to Pulpit Harbor. Oh my God, I'd have to jive to go to Pulpit Harbor. And with the wind making that all the time, I was, it wasn't safe to jive with the wind that strong. Well, they said they, they decided they wanted to do it anyway. And uh, I said, well, and just at this particular time, Leo Hines, who sailed with me, about six different times. He happened to be aboard this time. He looked at me, he said, if you don't drive, Jim, you lose the race. I said, well, I know we can't have that. All right, gang up on the main sheet. Come on, we'll, we'll bowser down. So we went to work, a whole gang of people on that main sheet. We got it nailed down just as tight as we could. And I took a turn around the cleat there and spun the wheel over. She jived over. When she jived, she houred last. The gaff up above came zinging across. And I, I slacked the sheet out until it was burning my hands, but it couldn't couldn't do it. I stopped the main boom in time, but the gaff came over, touched up on the rigging, and broke in half. Well, you lower the sail. We went in, then they decided they would go to Islesburg anyway. We lowered the sail. We ran up into Islesburg and anchored. I called my my old friend Captain Quinn over there in, in Camden. I said, put that old oak we have up in the in the attic there in the loft and uh, put it on the morning ferry. We took the sail down, we took a, unbent the sail from the, the gaff, <clears throat> we put the pieces together, we put the oak on there from the first ferry, we took a great long piece of, of a sheet I had for the, the main time of stasel, and we, we uh, served it all up and fished that gaff together. Now we're pouring, pouring seawater on it to uh, shrink the line and make it real tight. We, rigged it up again, and we went sail and went to Pulpit Harbor and won the race to Pulpit Harbor the next day with the old adventure. That's a, a Rico up there putting a stitch in the topsail on a calm day. There you can see my main topmast staysail coming down from the top towards the foremast. This was my crew one of the, one of the times. They just happened to be on board there. My cooks and my, my gang from that Peter Davidson, my mate, he was a great great guy, Nova Scotian, and uh, all having a great time on the adventure. This was our galley, perfectly clean galley, always perfectly clean. The old stove, black iron stove, we cooked with wood. The cook, most important person in the whole vessel, the cook, had to be up at five in the morning and getting the stove going for coffee. There's a petunia pump over there. They polish that every, every day just to make sure it would shine. Everywhere you could eat off the floor in that galley. Wonderful, wonderful food. Crazy galley people, and as I say, up and always at them and always working their heads off. <clears throat> have, have lunch up on deck when we had the proper conditions. Lots and lots of food. There's my little yaw boat, little 16 foot yaw boat with a 60 horse Osco, which is a Ford uh, Lehman engine, really, four cylinder Ford diesel in her. And we get a couple of knots out of her. I'd love to tell you the story about her coming into Gloucester that very last time. Oh my God, it was the most exciting thing. Where, hey, what, how, how's our time doing here? Oh, 644, not too bad. Well, I got to tell you this story just uh, real quickly. We were coming in, coming in, uh, the wind was fair when we came to Gloucester, took all the sails down. And this was uh, after the great schooner race, we had won the race, taking all the sails down. We were going in uh, with bare poles. Uh, the yaw boat wasn't pushing or anything once we got her started past the uh, paint factory there. And the wind kept making all the time, just on the bare poles of this schooner. And she kept going faster and faster and faster. I told my son, put it in reverse, put it in reverse. He had the yaw boat in reverse, didn't make any difference. The schooner, the schooner got on her, on her own line. I tell you, she, she, it's one of her habits, one of her quirks. She decided she's gonna go and she kept on going. And we were making, I don't know, three, four knots by the time we were right into the inner harbor there. And uh, I, we had this arrangement with the yaw boat. I usually turn the yaw boat around so that we could pull instead of push and pull the schooner and just slow it down. But it's a delicate maneuver and they're going too fast. I didn't think it would work, but I had to do something because the Ernestina was right up there at the dock and we were headed right for it and people were watching us coming. You know, they were getting excited, the vessel getting bigger and bigger and the Ernestina was getting bigger and bigger in my eyes. And I turned around to my son and I said, all right, you, we got we to gotta slow her down. We got to do it. So try and turn the boat around. And I had, I had taken the 
the line off the cleat back there. So he did, he turned the boat around. When it came sideways, of course, the momentum took over, the vessel, vessel uh, the tow line took over and uh, started to turn the all boat over. She started shipping water over the side of her. She was going to flip over and drown my son. But um, I was too quick for her. I took that line off and threw the painter right, right down uh, overboard. And uh, the all boat was saved. At the same motion, I turned around and I turned, pulled the, my mate up there forward, dropped the anchor, down went the anchor. And we're approaching the, uh, the Ernestina there, just going right for her, you know. People started leaving the Ernestina. They're getting worried we were getting so close. And down the anchor went, and I knew that, that harbor had been dredged. There was no mud down there to catch that anchor. So I told my, my mate, John McBride, I said, more chain, more chain, put more chain out over the barrel. But you had to free, free, the, free the chain over the barrel because it would catch on the whelps or in the old barrel. And you'd throw the, the chain over there, and then it would go out the hose pipe in a roar. And he kept throwing the line, the chain out, throwing the chain out. I said, more chain, more chain, John, more chain, more chain. And threw out. We had half of that box emptied by the time we finally slowed that vessel down and slowed down, slowed down, and just would luck have it. It, it stopped just about the right place so that my son and the old boat could come over to the side of her and push her into her berth. And everybody thought it was all planned that way. <laughs> they didn't know the anxiety of it all. But we got away with it again. The adventure, adventure is a lucky vessel. Here we are playing around with the yaw boat, uh, the seine boat. That's the way we took passengers ashore. And we were doing some crazy, I don't know. But people are so much fun. They have so much fun laughing, giggling, carrying on. And uh, it, well, that, there's the whole spirit of the whole thing right there. Uh, we the, the great schooner race. We were coming, in, coming into uh, Rockland ahead of the other boats. This was the start of the great schooner race. We started in... Uh, North Haven thoroughfare. This particular time, all the all the great all the great vessels uh, in the great schooner race. We did seven of these great schooner races. We won six of them, and that one that we didn't win, I've got excuses as long as your arm. Uh, why we didn't? Uh, winter time in the in Camden Harbor, we sometimes had ice, real thick ice, twelve inches thick. Sometimes, nice time to work on the top sides of the vessel, putting plank in her. Uh, over in uh, oh, Lionel Haven there, we were up into the cove. I can't think of the name of that cove right now, but anyway, uh, you sail up in there, and, and it was a real tight little reach. Wonderful thing. There's the old vessel going along. And, of course, wing and wing, we're running, running up the uh, bay there towards Mount Desert. Beautiful, beautiful day on the main coast. Here's uh, the... Uh, the book I mentioned, uh, well, this was one of the books about the adventure. That's Joe Garland, of course, the historian in the middle, and Leo Hines on the right. Leo Hines, an incredible fisherman that set all records in the adventure when she was a fishing vessel. And this was a, a book signing we had aboard the vessel. We had crowds of over 100 people aboard that day for the event. Uh, there's the book, the Queen of the, uh, Queen of the Windjammers, with a painting by Tom Hoyne. Tom Hoyne did six or seven trips with me on the adventure, taking pictures and doing paintings of all of it, uh, of the whole, uh, depicting the various vessels of the Gloucester fishing fleet. Wonderful artist. And there's my, my wife, Meg, the uh, admirable Admiral Meg. And uh, uh, that kind of concludes the, the vessel sailing off into the distance with Smart Breeze of Wind. There's that book. There's that wonderful book called Rift with Reckless Abandon. All you have to do is get in touch with us. Don't go to Amazon. Go to the Sail Power Sea, world famous Sail Power Sea Museum uh, right there in the south end of Rockland, and you'll get a signed copy. Uh, these are my memoirs, 40 years of voyage, and some of it's even true. <laughs> there you go. That's the end. No, no, that's not the end. That's not the end. Uh, I, I told you I'd have a surprise for you. That isn't the end. Don't touch that dial. I got a couple more words for you. That is about uh, the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum. Just a few more words. Open the curtain one more time. I got to show you this 
<clears throat> the new building that we put in, of course, you start with a backhoe up in the upper right there. You start with a backhoe right in the middle of Covaris, and you big, dig a big hole. And then you build to the right there, you build that building, and it comes up, and you can see a schooner. There's a schooner lying right. That's the schooner that uh, Peter wanted to stay over in right in the dooryard there. And then of course, the, the same picture with a fall flower there in the bow of the schooner showing, getting ready there. My wife commissioned a, a schooner running wing and wing made of granite, Joe Asiello, a granite sculptor did that right in front of the building. And uh, there it is running a great big granite block. And he sculpted that thing out uh, with curved to stone curved to the sails of that thing. Wonderful, wonderful. For my 88th birthday. Oh my God, who would believe that? <laughs> well, the skip program, I got to tell you just a little bit about the skip program. Sail so kids for free. We take these kids, these little kids, six to 14 years old, teach them to rig their sails, push them away from the dock. We have a chase boat. We tell them how to sail it. They're out there with their buddies. The first thing they do is try and outsail their butters, buddies. If they can't outsail them, if they can't go faster, they run into them, whatever works. They, you know, that's the way it is. And in a week's time, they really learn to sail. This is the way we do it. Sail kids for free. One day, the orientation. The second day, they push away from the dock. They go out around the buoys and back to the dock again. They have to do it on their own. They're the only ones in the boat. One guy to a boat. So they have to do it. They have to sail it. And then day three, around the buoys, turn the boat over, ride them up again. And day four, they're really learning to sail by, by day five. They all want to go back out and do it all over again. It is a marvelous thing. This is the way we work it. For $100, if you would donate $100 to the Sail Power Sea Museum, we're going to put a kid out in the water uh, in his boat. But we will guarantee you uh, we'll match that with another kid. So we'll get two kids for your 100 bucks. Two kids in, in two boats out there learning to sail for a whole week long sailing instruction class. Donate 200 bucks, you get four kids out, 300 bucks, six kids, do the math all the way down, five, a full class of 10 kids out there sailing. Join the SCIF program, Sail Kids for Free, S-K-F-F. Wonderful things, wonderful things going on at the Sail Power Steam Museum. One other thing I want to tell you about the morning in Maine, <clears throat> just about a month ago, this vessel, a, a, a day sailor out of Rockland, was donated to the museum business and vessel and the whole nine yards, as my wife says, the whole nine yards. We're gonna be running that vessel on two hour cruises of Penobscot Bay, two lighthouses and a two hour cruise uh, this summer. And that really is the end. And thank you no, all. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. No, it, but we're still looking for really? captains, captains for blackjack, our friendship sloops. And friendship sloops. We have two friendship oh, sloops. Greg on today. We have yeah. two, so, we have two uh, Harris we off 12 and a half, and we have instruction for adult and children. So we need captains for that kind of thing. So if you know any captains, let me know. <laughs> now we'll open it up for questions or comments, or it, you can't throw tomatoes, so you just have to wake up, everybody. <laughs> Captain, Captain Sharp, I just want to say one thing, and I'm not accusing you of anything, but uh -oh. those pictures that you showed of all those young girls, my God, you had fine taste. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, can't, I can't answer you. My wife's right behind me. <laughs> I can see that. I'll, Jim, I'll answer that. And you still do have fine taste. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much, my G. This has been fun. Jim, did did when she went fishing, did they ever have a top mast on her? To your knowledge? What, what was that? When she went fishing, yeah. Did she ever sail with the top mast? No. Okay. She was built as a power vessel. She had a, a CO engine in her when when she was built in 1926. And uh that picture of her with all the people on it, you've probably seen, uh, she's going out under power and that's the rig she has. She was bald headed right from the beginning. They did away the top with the top mists when they put power in them. Yeah, I just wondered whether Jeff, Jeff ever stuck one on there. No, so Jeff, Jeff of course had the urethra spinning before and he had the period and he had a whole lot of vessels with top mists. Yeah. But the adventure, yeah. 
the adventure was not a racing boat. It was a sensible fisherman and it was built to go fishing and set all records in the fishing industry. But it was the same hull as the little Elsie. I put her lines over the Elsie and she's very, very similar. She's from the same gene pool. So she's basically a sailing vessel hull. That's why I, I couldn't resist. I had to put it on my <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so we got any more questions for Jim? Uh, got any answers for Jim? <laughs> Well, come and see the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum in the South End of Rockland. We'll be looking for you this summer. Thank you, Jim. Peter, I'd just like to say this was a fantastic program. Oh, just, thank you, Richard. Uh, just call me Toby. That's that you know that's my real name. Yeah. Okay, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was being thank formal, you. sorry. <laughs> that's all right, Peter. I should I should know better. Well thank you, Toby. This was Peter. just this was just tremendous, and uh, I can remember sailing my schooner into Montrose Harbor in Chicago under bare poles, not not the way you were talking, Jim, coming into Gloucester Harbor, but it's a much smaller boat. But it built almost in the same year as Adventure. My schooner was built in Gloucester in 1929, yeah, and right. uh, <clears throat> it was amazing. Uh, you know, you were going to be a you were going to be a hero or a goat, you know, <laughs> it was no turning back, but you got no sales left. <laughs> May I ask a question about your musical performances? Or is there a regular schedule? Uh, the, the, we did have a, every two weeks we had a performer come and do a musical program for us. But when the Kovaris hit, we had to cancel that and we haven't started it up again since. However, we have a music jam. Every Sunday we have a music jam, summer and winter, from one to four in the afternoon. And uh, people bring their instruments. Uh, we don't advertise it because we don't want a big crowd because of the influenza, but uh, we still do it now. And uh, we usually have about, oh, a dozen, 15 people in the audience. And uh, just two weeks ago, we had 17 musicians. So wow. it's a howl. It's really a lot of fun. Thank you. I, I could vouch Jim, for that. <laughs> Hello, Jim Sharp. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Peter. Hey. Jim, I was aboard uh, as we were coming into the dock in Gloucester. Yeah. And I, took, and I did take a very firm hand on the rail because I thought we were going to crash, and I was <laughs> fooled you that time. I was, I? I was incredibly impressed by the how you did it, <laughs> and I just want you to say I'm probably the oldest board member in yes. America, and looking towards the future, the other Peter job is to make her able and i'm dedicating myself in your spirit to make her fast <laughs> that's very nice very nice he, Thank you. that peter better take care of her i'm gonna lick him with my cane if he doesn't <laughs> peter you peter ben you were uh, with us when we first delivered the vessel down to gloucester yes yeah. yeah. You remember sailing into Portsmouth? Actually, I got off the boat and I was in charge of getting all these flags that said Swallowtail oh. Adventure. And oh. I preferred to be off the boat and in the welcome committee, which you might remember with the blue flags with the Swallowtail. There were thousands, uh, hundreds of boats out there with a yes. Swallowtail Adventure flags. Yes, yes. That was. That was a wonderful event. I, I was all goosebumps all day. That was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you again. I went, this is a wonderful opportunity to tell the story of the old adventure in Maine. So you guys, you, you, it's your charge now and you better take care of her. We're doing that, Jim. We're doing that. I believe it. Careful, I got my eye. 
Yes. Thank, thank you, everybody, for uh, participating tonight. And thanks to Captain Shop and Meg for uh, putting this on. This has been incredible. It's been a wonderful evening, and it's it's been great to see some faces that I hadn't seen in a while. And uh, Jim and Meg are down in Florida enjoying their, their, their hot tub that was 49 degrees the other night. No, we haven't even gotten it. It's so cold here. <laughs> uh, Jim, warm her up. <laughs> anyway. Captain Sharp. Yes. I'd yes. like to thank you for all, for the great time we had on the adventure. Oh, thank you, Jim. Uh, I, I assure you, we, I was the one that had the most fun. We stepped on the adventure the day after we got married. Oh. Hello. In 1968. 1968. Well, now that was a long time back there. That, that uh, was. And yeah. in, wow. in 2018, 50 years later, we stepped back aboard the adventure. <laughs> Good for you. And it's it's a we have wonderful memories. Thank you. Thank everybody who's brought the adventure back to life. Well, I'm awful glad that that not held and uh, you went, went together all those years. Great. <laughs> well, we all have great memories. Yep. Great memories. Yep. Okay. I'm going to sign off. All right. Thank all you. Boys. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. All right, so glad care. you could all come. Everybody Fair be well. Fair <laughs> winds. Thanks, right. Jim and Meg. We'll talk. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> oh my God. Great. Hmm?